Would you stand with me, please, for the reading of God's Word this morning? I want to thank Pastor Todd for that awesome Word of God that he shared with you last week. That our identity is in Christ. We are called to die to ourselves and to live for Him. And I said, what a segue into what I was ready to preach. We generally plan our services about two weeks in advance around here. So if you think we're picking on you personally, it's not us, it's God. Amen, you better listen up. <laughs> we don't know what you're thinking, so don't tell us on the way out. You'll be telling on yourself. Amen. I'm reading from the book of John, St. John this morning, chapter 1, verse 10. It says, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. I want to talk to you this morning about the power of God to save. You know, one thing us preachers don't know is we don't know when we come to church who's going to be here and who isn't. And a lot of times, I know I speak for Pastor Todd too, a lot of times what God lays on our heart, we'll look out and think, you know, they really needed to hear this, but they're not here. A lot of you are here this morning, so guess what? You really, really need to hear this. Amen. So bow your heads with me and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I come before you right now as we are always before you. But Father, we come in that name is above every name. The name of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, our Lord, our leader, our Savior, and our God. Lord, we are living in those perilous times that you said would come when men would be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure more than the things of God. You said they'd be hateful and despicable. And Lord God, you also said many of them would be learning, seeking to learn of you, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Not because they can't, Father, but because they don't want to. We are also in that time, Father, when you said that you would send strong delusion to people that, that they might believe a lie and be damned because they want to be damned because they would not love the truth, would not embrace the gift of salvation, would not embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. The world hated your son as he walked through this world, Father, and your son said if they've done this to the master, what are they going to do to the disciples? Father, my prayer is this morning is that you would help me to lift high the blood-stained banner of the Lord. We are living in times when that banner is being lowered and lowered and lowered and just to the point, Father, that the love that you purchased for us on Calvary is almost being drugged through the dirt. You said in these last days that people would turn the grace of God into lasciviousness, into a wanton desire to an excuse to sin against you. And God, we are in those times. Father, you said there would also be a great falling away of people that have known you and walked with you. And Lord, because such things are coming on the earth, you said the heart of many would wax cold. But I thank you, God, that you also said there would be a great ingathering during this time. Father, my prayer is this morning from the bottom of my heart that not a single person that hears me in this room today or will hear later God, that they will hear your voice speaking to them in the depths of their very being, Lord God. And Father, that you will help all of us to prepare to be ready because you said you're coming in an hour that we think not. Help us to be ready, watching and waiting. Help us to have our lamps full of oil and our lights burning. Help us not just to be stagnant in our waiting, but as you were, Lord Jesus, busy about our Father's business, 
And God, help us to be ready in that hour that's going to overtake every person on this earth. And I ask these things in Jesus' name this morning. Amen and amen. You may be seated. The power of God to save. How many of you know in the depth of your being this morning that God still has the power to save? The way people talk these days, you would think he did not. You would think that we need to add everything under the sun to the power of God in our lives and we'll go to any fountain, we'll go to any resource, we'll go to anything or anybody except God to save us. God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah to Israel one day and he said, you keep going to cisterns that are broken to get water. You keep going after things that cannot save you, that cannot help you, but you will not come to God. And we are living in a day and time where people are trying everything to fix their hearts, to fix their lives, to fix their relationships, to fix themselves. And they will go to everything but God. And he is the only one that has the power to save. Amen. In verse 12 that I read to you, it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. While every human being was created by God, not every human being is a child of God. The world is very confused about that. To become a child of God, you've got to be born again of the Spirit of God. I heard a man say one time, he said, we're, we're in pretty good shape. He said, we're deaf, we're blind, we're dumb, and we're dead, but other than that, we're all right. That's how we come into the world, dead, and trespasses, and sins, spiritually blind to anything that really is God. Ears that are stopped from the very words that can save us in this life and in the life to come. And only Jesus can breathe that second breath of life into us. That's why the Bible calls him the second Adam. The first Adam, God the Father breathed into. The second Adam, the Holy Spirit of God, through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, has to breathe the life of God in you. There was a very religious man came to Jesus by night because he was chicken. He knew that God was with Jesus. He knew because of the works that Jesus was doing that nobody could do the works that Jesus was doing except God be with him. But he was more afraid of the religious people that he walked with than he was of God, but he really wanted to know, so he sneaked out at night, found Jesus somewhere, and he said, what? must I do to be saved? And Jesus answered him and said, I surely, surely I say unto you, that's what verily, verily means, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 tells us that the natural man, a person that has only been born by natural childbirth, cannot see or understand the things of God. That's why some of you have parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles that can quote the Bible forward and backward to you and still don't know anything about God. All they can do is read the letters, read the words. They have no spiritual understanding of what it means. That's why Paul said to young Timothy, he said in the last days there will be people that are ever learning the Bible but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because you must be born again or you cannot see the kingdom of God. One of our old hillbilly singers that died a drunkard in the back of a Cadillac years ago used to sing the song, I saw the light, I saw the light, glory to God, I saw the light. I'm not sure he did. Or if he did, it might have been down the wrong tunnel. I hope, pray to God, he made it to heaven. Some of you are old enough, you know who I'm talking about. But you're in a room with a lot of people, if you'd ask them what happened when you came to Christ, they'd say, the light came on. I heard about him, I heard people talk about him, I, I thought I even believed in him, but I got to the place 
to where I've now met him personally. I've been born again of his spirit, and the light of God has come on in my life. I used to pick up the Bible and try to read it, and it was just old history and hard words, and now when I open it up, the God of heaven and earth speaks to my heart and tells me how to walk and where to walk. I wanted to share this message with you today because I'm convinced that about 99% of Christianity today does not know a real Christian from a wall. And I want you to know what it really means to be born again. There are people that love Jesus Christ so much. There's a lot of them in this room. They love Jesus Christ so much that they are willing to deny themselves. They are willing to sacrifice whatever they have to. They're willing to forsake whatever they have to. They are willing to do anything that they have to to love him and serve him and walk with him. And you may not be one of those yet. Jesus may be no more than a good idea and some way to get my ticket punched so that I don't go to hell. But you've not yet encountered him as the Savior of your life. How will I know if I'm born again? Because you go to church? No, there have been people that went to church all their lives that are not born again. How will I know? Because I read the Bible now and then, or I read it a lot. Nope. There are a lot of lost people who read the Bible all the time. I just shared with you, they're going to be ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The biggest factor that will tell you that you, in fact, have been born again, before I tell you, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what Jesus said about being born again. He said it to the same man. He said, being born again is like the power of the wind. He said, you don't know where it comes from. You can't see where it's going. It just has a major effect on your life. But I can tell you what the wind of God's spirit will do, and you will know it immediately. You will lose the desire to habitually practice sin. Yeah. You will lose the desire to want to do anything that displeases God. That's the desire you'll get. You'll, you'll lose the desire to displease him. For the first time in your life, you will say, what matters most in my life is God and my relationship with him. Am I right in walking in that relationship? 1 John 3 said, verse 7, John said, little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he, and he's talking of Jesus, is righteous. He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. I'm reading King James this morning. It's very poetic. Shakespearean, if you will. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, and he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. My Lord, Pastor Harris, how can you say such a thing? I didn't say it. I just read it. The Word of God says it. <laughs> Do you know how many thousands, probably millions of people that are sitting in churches just like this one this morning who have no idea that they are supposed to stop sinning against God habitually, practicing sin, but they believe that because they intellectually embrace the thought of Jesus Christ, that somehow that makes them Christian and they're on their way to heaven. In the book of Jude, it tells us in these last days that people are going to turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. You know what lasciviousness is? It's out of control, wanton desire to sin and do what you want to do. One of the greatest plagues on Christianity in our generation is the very thing God sent to set us free, and that's grace. If you are believing in a grace that allows you to go on willfully sinning, habitually sinning, you're, you're, that's a delusion. 
you're going to find out one day when you stand before God, you're going to find out that you believed a lie and that you loved a lie because it was easier to believe a lie and because you loved the lie. And you know what? You're not going to argue with it. The Bible said every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord to the glory of God. There will be no lost people who accidentally end up in hell but there will be no saved people who accidentally end up in heaven. Jesus Christ has called us to follow him and become his disciples and live out Christianity. Well, Pastor Ken, that's the craziest thing I ever heard. It's the craziest thought I ever had. You're looking at an ex-drug addict, an ex-alcoholic, an ex-three packs of cigarettes a day, cigarette sucking fool that got saved and found out, well, we don't really have to live for God. Jesus loves us and he just covers it all. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Don't take my word for it. Turn over to the last page in your Bible and see what it says about who's going to enter heaven and who isn't. Nothing that makes a lie, nothing that sins, nothing that commits abomination, nothing that defiles is going into that holy city. Nothing. Nothing. You know, the first thought comes to people's minds, well, nobody's perfect. God didn't ask you to be perfect, and you're right. Nobody's perfect, and by the way, nobody ever thought you were. Carla thought I was early on, but she found out different. God has not called you to be perfect, and you can't be perfect, and I can't be perfect, but you know what we can be? We can be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what you can do. See, there's a big difference between being, not being perfect and being disobedient. You're going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes. Everybody's going to make mistakes because we're all human. In fact, we're kind of in a catch-22. The lost world out here wants the church to accept everybody just the way they are. So when they come in and sit down and look around and don't see Jesus, they can say, well, they're all hypocrites. I don't have to go there. How stupid is that? But that's what they want, right? No, but the reality is you and I have to walk in the light as he is in the light, the light and knowledge of God that we have. Sin isn't going in. You know what? Most of the church has turned into, not all of the church. There's only one real church. And it's not just this one. This is a real church. It really is. But there isn't just this one. There's hundreds of them, thank God. Maybe even thousands all around the world. I don't know. But you know what most churches are preaching today? Self-help. Get everybody in there. Make them feel good about where they're at right now. Help them to fix a few things in their life and send them home. And hopefully they'll keep tithing and coming back. That's what most churches are doing. They don't mention sin that is going to send people to hell, that is going to destroy people's lives, that are going to destroy their bodies, going to destroy their relationships. And there's not a preacher in that Bible that doesn't talk about sin. Because you know why? If I can get you to Jesus, I don't have to fix you. He will fix you. You won't need my 10 steps to overcome this or overcome that. You will have the Son of God Almighty and the power of the Holy Spirit living down inside of you, and he will lead you and guide you and set you free. <laughs> Amen. Listen to what Jeremiah said years ago. He said, the days come, saith Jehovah, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel. How many of you know we're walking under that new covenant if you're a child of God? It said, with the house of Judah, but this is the covenant that I'm going to make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Jehovah. I will put my law in their inward parts, and in their heart will I write it. And, it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Whew. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No, Jehovah, or God, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin will I remember no more. You know why? Because God's going to put his spirit down inside of you. He's going to write his law on the tables of your heart. And the preacher won't have to chase you to church. Your relatives won't have to try to get you to come to God. 
You'll love God so much that you will want to be in his presence. You'll want to be in his house. And Hey, by the way, if you don't want to be in his house for a little while on earth, what makes you think you're going to want to be there forever in eternity? God changes the heart of his children. You know, one of the things I'm going to love about heaven is they're all going to be real Christians up there. All the phonies will be weeded out. Sadly, but they'll be weeded out. Jeremiah went on to say in that chapter, he said, Behold, I'll gather them out of all countries, whether I have driven them in my anger and in my fury and in my great wrath, and I will bring them again unto this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Jeremiah was talking to Israel when he spoke those words thousands of years ago. When God brought the Israelites out of Egypt and claimed them as his people, he said, if I'm going to take you into a promised land. If you will listen to my word, if you will obey my word and do what I ask you to do, he said, you'll be the head and not the tail. He said, you'll be blessed rising up. You'll be blessed setting down. You'll be blessed going out of your house. You'll be blessed going in. You'll be blessed in the field, and you'll be blessed in your house. He said, but if you go and you take on, you start worshiping and following all the teachings of the heathen in, the heathen in this land, following their gods and following their idols, he said, I'm going to scatter you. I'm going to call for the four winds of heaven, and I'm going to scatter you all over the face of the earth till you will not be a nation. He did that, started it in 70 A.D. The nation of Israel was not a nation for 2,500 years until May of 1948 at the end of the Second World War. Because those same prophets that prophesied that they would be scattered said in the latter days, God said, I'm going to call for the four winds of heaven again, and I'm going to bring you where you were scattered. I'm going to bring you back, and I'm going to put you right back in Jerusalem, in your homeland. If you think we're not in the last days, you're kidding yourself. We're not in the very last days yet, and I'll tell you why. Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by the armies of the world, he said, look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. They're going after Israel now, but they're not surrounded yet, but you better keep your eyes open, and you better get your heart and your life ready and right with God, because something called the rapture is about to happen. <laughs> God's word is true from Genesis to Revelation, every jot, every tittle. You need to read the book and find out. I've been telling atheists lately, and unbelievers, they'll say, I don't believe the Bible. I say, you ever read it? No. It's kind of dumb, isn't it? It's the Word of God. It claims to be the Word of God, and you're going to say you don't believe it. You never even picked it up and looked at it? No. He said, I'm going to send them strong delusion that they might believe a lie. Why? Because that's what they want. That's what they want. So he's talking to them, but listen to what he says. And I'll give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever, the good of them and their children after them. He's not only talking about Israel, he's talking about people that will come in under this new covenant through Jesus Christ. He said, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. But I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. This is the reverential fear of God. Am I born again, Pastor? Let me ask you, what, what, what's your fear level of God? <laughs> do you fear him enough to do what his word tells you to do? Do you fear him enough to live for him when nobody else is watching? Do you fear him enough that you know that he's God and you're going to answer to him one day and you better be walking where you're supposed to be walking? I don't know if I'm ever coming back to this church. That's all right. The Holy Spirit's going to follow you out of here with these words today. And it ain't about whether you come back to this church or not. I want you to be in heaven. I want to see every face that I see here this morning. I want to see you in the clouds of glory one day when we are there forever, eternally. I want to see every one of you there. And so does the Savior that died for you. See, if you're really born again... God places the fear of God in your heart. That scripture I read earlier, it said that if you're a child of God, you cannot sin against God. It doesn't mean that you don't have the ability to do it anymore. He doesn't cut your hands off, poke your eyes out, and all that stuff. You have the ability to do it, but you know what? 
you have the fear of God down inside of you that will not let you do it as long as you choose to do his will. That's the other fly in the ointment. You've been made in the image and likeness of God. You have a will just like God has a will. You can choose. The animal kingdom, they don't choose. They have been programmed. That's why they can live a better life than you and I do. They follow what they have been programmed to do. Man is the only one that can mess things up. I was working in a factory years ago. We were sitting outside at lunchtime. We were sitting on buckets, a bunch of us in a circle, and we we're sitting over top of an anthill, Cindy. And we got to, everybody got to watching them ants. We weren't even talking. We were just watching them ants. And they, I mean, there was millions of them. They were running toward this hole and all of them going in. And after a while, I looked up at the guys and I said, I don't see one wreck. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, we think we are the smartest creature on the planet. I said, look at them ants. They are not wrecking. They're going in by the hundreds. I said, you ever see a couple of us at a four-way stop sign? And we think we're all that in a bag of chips. But see, they have been made in the perfection of God. We are the only creature that, number one, we, we know that we know that we exist. Did you know animals don't know that? They just are. <laughs> they do not have the ability to know. God created you in his image and his likeness. But he's not going to look just like I look physically or just like you look physically. But his likeness has been created in us in that he gave us free will and choice. Scary thought. You have the choice to be a child of God, become a child of God, live with God forever, or to split hell wide open, but the choice is yours. People say, why does a loving God send people to hell? He doesn't. He has provided the only way out. You have to take it. Say, what do I have to do to go to hell? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Don't do anything and you'll end up there. Don't accept the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Don't accept the fact that you're supposed to obey the gospel and live for God. Just, just ignore all that and do nothing. And you'll die and go to hell and most people are going to. Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way and few there be that find it. That's why when somebody finally clearly explained the gospel to me, I got saved. People ask me for years, they say, what turned you around like that? I said, I found out I was going to hell. I quit lying to myself about it. I quit lying to other people. And I quit lying to God. And I got honest about it and said, okay, God, I got a problem. What do we do about it? He said, you can't do anything, but I've done it. I've done it. I've made a way. <laughs> Listen to what God says. He said, I'm going to put the fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. And yea, I will rejoice over them to do them good. I will plant them in the land assuredly, I love this, with my whole heart and with my whole soul. You know what the first commandment is in the 10? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. You know why he wants you to do that? Because if you'll do that, he will love you back with all of his heart, all of his soul, all of his mind, and all of his strength, and it ain't a fair trade. He's got much more to bring to the table than you do. <laughs> but he wants it all. He wants your heart, not just your head. See, if, if, you, if you know a Jesus that's only in your head, and you only do what you want to do, and, and you only do certain things, and there's no fear of God before your eyes, and you're not worried about obeying the gospel, you know what you have? You have religion. You don't have salvation. You don't have a relationship with God. You've got a religion. But so do a million other people on the planet that are all going to die and go to hell. Religion, just doing religious things, will not get you to heaven. You must be born again of the Spirit of God, and you'll know when you're born again because the fear of God will be placed in your heart. It'll be like the wind. You may not see anything coming, see anything going. You may not feel anything but it'll be different. You say, how to get to that place? You just got to get serious with God. God, at this moment in my life, in this day, in this time, for me, it was the 22nd of May, 1978, 7.35 in the morning. I know because I was standing beside a machine where I worked, there was a big clock on the wall. And I bowed my head to pray, and I said, God, I'm through lying to me, I'm through lying to you, I'm through playing around with it. I know that there's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain, 
And God, I don't know if anybody knows the way, but if you'll show me, I'm going to go wholeheartedly. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm in it, because about five minutes later, a boy walked up and handed me a New Testament. He said, here's the way. <laughs> See, God said in Deuteronomy 5, he said, if from here you will seek me with all of your heart, you'll find me. You say, where is here? Anywhere. Anywhere that you'll seek him with all of your heart, you'll find him. And when you find him, realize he is a pearl of great price, that you want to sell whatever you've got to sell, you want to forsake whatever you have to forsake, or whoever you have to forsake, or whatever you have to forsake, and hold on to that pearl and keep your eyes on him. See, when we're born again, God places through the power of the Holy Spirit the reverential fear of God in our hearts. And with this in mind, I want to look at my opening text again. I want you to see this thing. It said he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. When the Bible talks about the world, it talks about anyone and anything that is displeasing to God. And let me tell you something about God. He's not a killjoy. He's not a party pooper. He's not out there to make you feel bad or to, to ruin all your good times. Anything that God tells you that is bad for you will kill you. You may not drop dead in the immediate moment, just like Adam and Eve didn't drop dead the minute they ate that fruit, but they started to die. And that's what sin will do. The wages of sin is death. It'll kill you. If God says no, it's because it's hurtful to you. And on the other side of the coin, if he says to do something, you better do it. Why? Because it is health and life to you and blessing to you. You may not always understand it, but it will be that. That's why you need to learn to listen to him. But those that are part of the world are people that are still choosing, I am not going to live life God's way. I'm going to do it my way. And many of them are playing Russian roulette with five barrels loaded because they know enough about God. They've been in enough church service. They're thinking, somewhere down the line, not now, not today, not tomorrow, not this week, not this year even maybe, but sometime I'm going to get right with God. And i got to tell you, there's thousands of people, millions of people in hell that were going to wait till the moment they got right with God who didn't get that chance. Some people do. The only good thing I can see about people being terminally ill is that a lot of times it leads them to Christ. When they finally come face up with life and death, which we all are face up with every moment of every day, really, there's not one extra second promised to you. I'm glad I'm preaching this today. If this was the last sermon I ever preached, I'll be glad to meet Jesus and say, yep, this is what I said. And you never know. But see, we're still a part of the world if we don't want the things of God. And most of the world is going to be lost. It says he came unto his own and his own received him not. He was talking about the nation of Israel and the religious leaders of his day. They want nothing to do with him. Now, Jesus didn't get crucified because he was going around telling them how to fix their marriages or train their kids or eat the right foods or all the other stuff. You realize they did not crucify him for that. Neither did they crucify him for going around and saying, you need to love everybody. You need to love your enemies. Do good to those that despitefully use you. You know, those are all good things. God teaches us to do all of those things, to look at all those areas of our lives. But that wasn't what he was crucified for. You know what he was crucified for? Because he told them they had to repent. They had to stop sinning against God and live for God. You say they crucify him for that? Yeah. Just like the world will crucify you if you, you get a chance to tell them what they really need to do. Some of you are ready to crucify me right now. <laughs> you say, I'm sorry I walked in here today. You won't be in eternity if you'll listen to what I'm telling you. You won't be. You'll say, Pastor Ken, I wish you to preach the same thing. I wish you'd got down on your knees. I wish you'd have cried. I wish you'd have begged to get me to serve Christ, especially if you go into eternity without him. He came unto his own, his own received him not. You know, the devil don't care if you get religious. 
He don't even care if you start going to church. He don't care if you start tithing. He don't care if you start telling everybody at work about Jesus. You can put bumper stickers on your car, magnets on your refrigerator. Just whatever you do, don't really serve God. In fact, he likes it better if you don't. You become a double agent, a secret agent, a double O nothing but for the kingdom of hell. Because you'll turn people away from God. Because you go around telling them, I, I serve Jesus. I'm like Jesus when you're not. And you know what they do? They say, well, if that's Jesus, I don't want nothing to do with. This is another reason we need to live for God with everything that we are. And you need to live for God in a way that other people can see that you're living for God. You've got to get past, well, i just got to do enough to make sure I don't go to hell. Because if that's all you ever do, you won't be successful at it. Because your standard and God's standard are two different things. It said, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Whew. If I get born again, I'll be without excuse. I won't be able to use all those lies to tell everybody why I don't serve God. Why? Because God will give me the power to serve him. I remember being on the other side, not being a Christian, and I remember different times in my life thinking, I knew a few people that were Christians. I believe some of them really were. And I remember thinking, I thought, I'll never be that. I can never live like they're living. I can never do what they're doing. And you know what I found out? I found out I was right. In my own power, I couldn't do it. But look what it goes on to say. He gave him power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I got to tell you something. When the Bible says, uses the word believe, it means more than an intellectual assent or a mental belief. You can miss heaven by 18 inches. The devil believes in God, but he's not going to heaven. The Bible said he believes in God and even trembles, but he's not going to heaven. You know why? Because he won't serve God. He won't serve God. He wanted to be God. See, that's our problem, too. We have that nature. We don't want to serve God. We want to be God. We want to be the little God of our lives. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Nobody's going to tell me where to go. Nobody's going to tell me how to act. But there's God in the universe that's trying to save you and wants to help you. He said, even to them that believe on his name. You know what 98% of Americans claim today? They're born again and they know Jesus Christ. Now, you know that's a lie. All you got to do is look across the country. Look at the culture. Don't just go outside your door there for an hour or two. Look around. You'll know that's a lie. But you know why they think that? They think because they believe in God intellectually. But that's biblical belief, and it isn't. Biblical belief is, is if you really believe it, you act upon it, you live out what you believe. And if you're not living it out, you don't really believe it, you just think about it. But if you really believe on his name then you believe on the person of who he is and what he is. It says, which were born not of blood. It's fantastic that your grandmother loved Jesus like she did, but guess what? Her loving Jesus like she did will not get you into heaven. Just because it's your bloodline. You might have five pastors. You might be the fifth generation in a line of pastors. But that isn't going to get you to heaven, and that isn't going to make you a Christian. It isn't blood. And you know what else it isn't? It says, nor the will of the flesh. Nor the will of the flesh. Now, the flesh is pretty strong. It can do some stuff. It can pretend a lot of stuff. It can put on religious garb that is outward, that looks holy and upright, and you can do all kinds of things that other people see and just think, man, butter wouldn't melt in your mouth, as Mama used to say. But the reality is, Jesus looked at a group of people like that, and he said, inside you're full of dead men's bones. You're religious, and people can walk over you like they're walking over graves. Why? Because it's not the will of the flesh. You can't decide one day, well, I'm just going to be a better person and save myself. There's one thing for certain. You could start today and become that perfect person that none of us are, and guess what? you still got all those sins you've already committed following you here. It's not the will of the flesh. You all breathe and you were really quiet. It's all right. I'm glad I got your attention. I don't need applause, praise, especially when we're talking this serious, and I am talking serious. 
the will of the flesh. Well, I got a problem, so I'm going to take 10 steps and I'm going to fix it. No, you're not. And if you do fix that problem, guess what's going to happen? You're going to develop another problem. Just deciding the will, oh, I'm going to do it better, I'm going to do it better, I'm going to do it better, I'm going to do it better. I'm going to do it better. That isn't going to do it. The will of the flesh will not get you there. Nor the will of man, it says. You've got to be born of the Spirit of God. You can sit here today and say, Pastor Ken, I hear you. I believe you. I'm going to be the best Christian that I can be from here on out. Not unless you're born again. Because you're going to walk out of this door, and probably even before you get out of the door, the devil's going to challenge you. How many of you know the devil ain't afraid to go to church? Demons aren't afraid to go to church. The Bible said angels and demons watch us when we're in church. I know they're here. I see them manifest sometimes for some reason. Some of you say, I love Jesus, and then you're meaner than a junkyard dog. <laughs> you got to be born again of the Spirit. You want to see what an authentic Christian looks like real quick because I'm out of time? Romans 8.1, this is what a real Christian looks like. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. So you need to be born again because without the power of the Spirit of God in you, your fleshly appetites will dictate your behavior. And you'll do devilish things right after you leave church in the parking lot before you get out the end of the driveway. It goes on to say this, though, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh. Jesus said it this way. He said, if I had not come and spoken the words that no other man had, well, you'd all have an excuse for your sin. He said, but now because I have come and spoken those words, you have no cloak. You've got to give up the excuses and the reasons. In Galatians 5.19, it tells us what lost people look like. It said, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery. Married to one person, you go start running and sleeping with another. Fornication, you're sleeping with somebody you're not married to. Uncleanness, that's all kind of things. Lasciviousness, you know what lasciviousness is? We have another word for it, we call it addiction. God calls it sin. We like to call it addiction because if we call it addiction, we don't really have to deal with it. We'll just hang around it a while, we'll lie to ourselves, we'll lie to everybody else, tell them it's, it's a sickness and it's a disease and it ain't our fault, when in reality it is. Thank you. Idolatry. What's idolatry? Anything that you put ahead of God that keeps you from serving God. And sometimes that idol can be you. Your will against God's will. Witchcraft. Do I really have to tell you what that is? I bet some of you don't know this, though. That's where we get the word pharmacy. There's nothing wrong with medicine. Jesus said those that are sick need a physician. I should say there's nothing wrong with some medicine. Walt, Brother Walt taught me they practice medicine. Try the blue ones. If they don't work, come back. We'll give you the red ones. But you know, witchcraft also entails manipulation. When you're trying to manipulate people. Witchcraft is anything of a mixture that you're trying to force your will on somebody else's will, whether it's drugs, whether it's peer pressure, whatever it is. That's what it is. Hatred. Hatred. Social media and COVID. We caught a worse disease than COVID during the pandemic, I can tell you. You know what it is? Hatefulness. People got meaner and more hateful. They're more hateful on the highways. They're more hateful in the stores. They just got mean-er <laughs> than they were. Variance. Variance is, we got another word for it. It's called click. I love this group, I don't like that group. I love this person, but I don't like that person. You know, Christians are supposed to love all of humanity, and even their enemies. 
Emulations, that's keeping up with the Joneses. Wrath, that's you wanting to take them out on 81 with a 50 caliber. I know because I got to put my little inner child down sometimes. He tries to rise up and do that. I said, I understand, Lord, if I even think of it, you know. Strife, strife, tension, strife. Just a problem, just cause strife. Everywhere you go, everything you do. These, these are what lost people do. Sedition. Seditions is rebelling against authority. Judas Iscariot was leading a band of slaves, or trying to. He was leading an insurrection. He was committing sedition against the government. And we're not supposed to do that. Heresies, any false teaching that is not God's word. Envies. Envies cause the next one, which is murders. I envy and want something you have that I don't have, and I'd be willing to take your life to get it. And drunkenness. Do you know the Bible says that it doesn't say you can't drink? I hate to even say this. God knows my heart. Because I used to be a drunk. And I know there's a very thin line between your little white wine at Olive Garden and being a drunk. You know, the, every drunk that ever ended up in the gutter, they didn't get up one morning sober and say, you know what, I'm going to be a drunk by next year. But the Bible doesn't say that you can't drink, but it does say drunkenness will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And you better be careful. I don't think they're going to do breathalyzer tests when the rapture takes place, see how far in you are. And I used to be a drunk. We can lie to ourselves about how sober we are. It says, those, as I've told you before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And there's churches full of people that live all of this, or the biggest part of it every day, and they think they're going to heaven, and they're not. You say, are you judging them? No. I am just like Jesus. I don't have to judge them. The word that God sent will judge them, and that's the standard that they will stand up against in the last day, Jesus said. Now, here's what a real Christian looks like. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, <laughs> joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, and meekness. You'll know a real Christian when you run into one of them because that sticks out like a sore thumb in this world. It sticks out like a light in darkness. It's like a city that's set on a hill and can't be hid. They'll see it. I used to think as a Christian I had to go run people down and witness to them. All you got to do is live for God. They'll come to you. They'll see you. They'll see the light. They'll see your heart. They'll see your love. They'll see your patience. They'll see your gentleness. They'll see your goodness. And they'll say, I need some of that. The Bible says it this way. They'll taste of the Lord and see that he's good and want some. It says, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. I wish it didn't say that. I wish it said, and they that are Christ are going to one day, ten steps later, crucify the flesh. <laughs> it doesn't say that. It says, if you belong to Christ, you will crucify those things. What's that mean? You put it to death. Some of you don't win your battles against sin because you argue with the devil about it. You're going to lose. You lose your battle with sin because you think somehow you're going to be able to hold on to it and coddle it and talk to it and rub it a little bit and pacify it and go to the store and buy five more of it and then I'll get over it. No, you won't. You got to kill it. How do I do that? I'm glad you asked. One wise man said, if you're going to crucify yourself, make sure you use rubber nails. But let Jesus do it. He's a carpenter. <laughs> The Holy Spirit will do it, but you know how he does it? By obeying the gospel. Not by focusing on your sin, not by focusing on, on your habit, not by focusing on your addiction, by focusing on God, by focusing on his word and doing what it says. How shall a young man cleanse his way, the psalmist said, by taking heed thereunto according to thy word. And the sooner you start obeying it, the easier it's going to be to walk with God and get cleansed. It'll fall off like a disease falling off you. It'll be the leprosy that'll drop if you get a heart after God to start following him. This might be the last one I ever get to preach. I don't know. I don't know. But I'm glad I preached it. The 
Christian life through the power of God. The righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh, praise team, would you come to the platform? For they that are after the flesh, do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Who are you listening to today? Your flesh, your way, your will, or are you listening to God? For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you, but now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Pastor Ken, that's strong stuff. It's the book of Romans. Read it. Well, he really didn't mean that. He meant that was like the third metaphor to the fifth power of quit lying to yourself and get right with God. Well, I know other people, they go to church and they don't do that. I know they're on their way to hell. The devil doesn't care if it's a bar store or a church pew as long as you don't serve God. But if the spirit of him that, well, let me, I missed something here. It said, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. How many of you know what your mortal body is? It's not that new body you're going to get when you go to heaven. I know people think, well, I'll just be a sinner till, we're, till we reach heaven. When we get to heaven, God will change us and we won't sin anymore. That's a lie out of hell. Jesus came to set people free from sin, not in their sins. The power of God to save. That's what I'm telling you about today. <laughs> I'm laughing, but I should be crying. I do cry a lot. I watch people all over social media, people that used to serve God and don't serve God anymore, people that think they love God and they don't love God. You can tell by their lives, the way they're living, the way they talk and the things they do, they don't know, they don't know Christ at all, but they think they're on their way to heaven. You better make sure you're on your way to heaven. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. If you live after the flesh, you're going to die. I got some news for a lot of Christians. The wages of sin is death before you're saved and after you're saved. If you keep on sinning, willfully sinning, deliberately sinning against God, it's still going to have the same killing effect on you. If you live after the flesh, you're going to die. But if through the Spirit you do mortify, put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but you receive the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, dear, blessed Father God in heaven. Why? Because we're sons and daughters of the Most High King. Marion, I'm glad he didn't leave me where he found me. Blake, I'm glad Jesus didn't leave me the person I was where he found me. I'm glad he had the power to set me free. He had the power to enable me to embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ and to live for him. And because it is to whosoever will, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever will believe on him, not just up here, but with everything that you are, and go after him and live and obey the gospel and love him. Oh, well, you can't be saved by being good. You're right, you can. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. But see, what most Christians miss is this. You can't save yourself. Jesus went to the cross and paid the only sacrifice that could get your forgiveness to get you into heaven. But if you receive that sacrifice, this Bible teaches you're no longer your own. You're bought with a price. You belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are to obey and follow the gospel. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7, he said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. He said, But he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. In Matthew 25, he said, I was sick and in prison. I was sick. I was out without clothes. I didn't have food, and you came to me. And they said, Lord, when do we come to you? He said, when you've done it unto the least of these. And he said, come into the joy of the Lord, because you gave. To the other group, he says, to the goats, he separates them as the sheep and the goats. And I always say this. I'm going to say it again. Sheep follow Christ. Goats would follow Christ, but 
Because that's what goats do. They butt. Oh, I know I need to get right with God. I know I need to start coming to church regularly. I know I need to be faithful to God. I need to start reading the Bible. I need to start finding out what it means to be a Christian. But, and all of those are led off into damnation according to the story that Jesus told in Matthew 25. You know what the only difference between the two were? One did and the other didn't do the will of Almighty God. Would you stand and bow your heads and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just come before you right now. Father, I pray that you would touch every heart in this room, that you would give us all a spiritual checkup, not from the neck up, but from, from the heart up, Lord God. And Father, as I have stood in pulpits over the last 40 plus years, I have seen others preach this message. I have preached this message to others. And I've seen people walk out of church services and lose their lives without hope and without God. Father, I know your heart is, is that you don't want that to happen to a single human being. Your son died, suffered, became the sacrifice, became every sin, every sickness, every disease, every wrong that has ever inhabited this world, that we could be redeemed from that could be healed from it, that we could be set free to serve you in righteousness and true holiness, to yield every part of our being to you, Father. God, break through the media, break through the delusions and the lies, the philosophies of this world, and God, let that word that I've spoken today, because it's your word, flow clear as crystal from your throne. Lord, you said that river is healing for the nations, for any person that will reach out to you to touch you. And Lord, say, I want to be your child. God, let, let every person in the sound of my voice surrender all to you. And Father, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Jesus' sake, and for the sake of us all in eternity, I pray. Amen. And amen. These altars are open. I can't believe that I've preached what I've preached, and God hasn't touched many hearts in many ways and said, you know what, there's things you need to put at the foot of the cross. Some of you, you need to get saved today. Today is the accepted time. Behold, now is the time and the moment that you need to quit running from God. Some of you, he keeps knocking at the door of your heart. He just keeps coming after you. You know it. He's speaking to you in all kinds of situations and circumstances, and you feel him calling you home. It's time to quit running. It's time to surrender. It's time to say, God, I've tried it my way. I need Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Can we have lights down, please? As we worship you need to come, if you need to be saved, and don't be, don't be embarrassed by coming. You, you know, I heard Dave Wilkerson say one time, and it was a powerful thing, he said, be ashamed of sin, and don't be ashamed of getting right with God. Amen? Because, well, what will people think? Don't worry about what people think. You need to worry about what God knows. <laughs> We're going to worship. These altars are open, and I don't believe there's anything more important in your entire life than being in this moment right now. Letting God touch your heart. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come before you to tell you that we love you. Lord, we worship you. We honor you. Lord, we pray, Lord, that what we've done here in this service for you, to you, that might be a sweet aroma to you, Father God, that you've seen our hearts, Father God, that express our love for you. Father God, we realize that in this moment there's nothing more important to know you as Lord and Savior, to be living a life pleasing to you, submitting our will to your will. Heavenly Father, have your way in, in our lives, each individual here, Father God. Lord, I ask that you examine our hearts, examine our motives. Father God, if there's anything impure in our life, Father God, I ask you to clean it out for us. Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now and right at the part from the sanctuary.
Father, we're not departing from your presence. So I ask that you go with each one of us, Father God, that this coming week that we might have divine appointments, Father God, with those who don't know you as Lord and Savior. Father, give us the words to speak. Give us the actions, Father God, with 